what money conversations did you have when you were growing up? How did those conversations or the lack thereof shape your relationship with money? Are you enjoying generational wealth or trying to create it now for you and your family? Then this show is for you. You are watching Influence Media, PSI TV, the Netflix of biz brands. Sabrina Protic is my guest today, and we're talking about her latest book, Hindsight to Insight, Money Between Friends and Family. Well, Sabrina is a four-time best-selling author, financial coach, and my friend. Welcome, Sabrina. Thank you so much for having me on your show, Trudy. Sabrina, when we met decades ago, you were a corporate executive, and now you are a multi-published author and business owner. What triggered that pivot? Well, a lot of it was, was changes in the world, the economy, and even that opportunity I had at, at a career woman. But I still kind of stayed in the same thing because when you met me, I was a corporate operations manager responsible for the financial strength of the organization. So I just did a transfer from, you know, taking care of corporate finances to ensuring the financial strength of households. Oh, awesome. Okay. Did that happen during COVID? It did. It did. So, you know, I, I worked for a Fortune 500 company. It was pretty solid. And then they had to downsize. And I was one of a thousand that was um, found myself unemployed. And it was the perfect time for me to reassess what was going to be my next move. And I really didn't want it to be employment because I'd done that. But I thought, what can I do to support family, friends, communities, women who are struggling financially. And this just was an easy fit for me. Sabrina, money is still, still, even in 2024, somewhat of a taboo topic of sorts. I mean, even employees are discouraged to discuss pay amongst themselves. So asking others how they're doing financially kind of is not a comfortable conversation. And conversations around money continue to be awkward. So in chapter one of your book, you asked the reader, did your family discuss money at all? And then you follow that up in chapter four with the freedom to discuss money. So this whole money conversation, freedom to talk about money is clearly an, uh, a thing of importance to you. So what is your actual take on the conversation around money, especially with a family? Well, Trudy... I victimized myself because the entire time I worked at corporate America, I didn't talk about money. I was I was raised in a culture where we didn't tell anybody how much money we made, how much we saved. We didn't talk about financial goals. It was just taboo. So when I worked at corporate America and some of my peers were talking to financial advisors and getting their money straight, I'm like, mm -mm, not me. They're not getting in my business. And so Oh, I would not talk to a financial advisor because my mindset was, why are you want to know about my money and my situation? And I was very tight lipped and also very uneducated. So when I lost that corporate job, was I OK financially? I'm going to say semi because I could have been better if I had talked about money, sought some guidance and direction about money. And then my whole life from that point on to now, that trajectory could have changed. But because of my upbringing, mm, 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 we don't talk about that. And so I couldn't prepare. I couldn't prepare for retirement. I couldn't prepare for my children and make sure their financial journey would be better than mine because all I could pass down to them was what was passed down to me, which was mm, mm, don't talk about money. Do you think in any way, because you mentioned the culture, that that is part of the African-American culture or was it just your specific family? I'm going to say it's part of the African-American culture. And I, I have validated that because now that I've been in this industry for almost five years, I see the common thread that a lot of African-Americans, they don't talk about it and they don't know much about what's going on in their households financially. There are uh, Hispanic cultures. They have a whole different spin on talking about finances and every man and woman is, you know, and child, you're on your own. Uh, some of the Caucasian cultures, they talk freely about money, 
And I had to adjust to that when I married my husband because he's talking about it. I'm like, we don't talk about that. So it, it is, there, there is a difference. And so if you don't talk about it, you can't get a plan. You can't prepare. And consequently, that's probably some of the reasons for our economic divide, culturally speaking, in the world today. Mm. Wow. So your book, Hindsight to Insight, is, I thought, foundational when it comes to talking about money, the whole introduction to money management and wealth. And your language in the book is, is very easy to understand. So who did you have in mind when you wrote this book? Who was the intended audience? I have to be honest, primarily it was my adult children because my son now is an adult, my daughter's an adult, and, and I didn't pass on to them what I should have. So, you know, you start with home first. So first I got myself together. And once I realized the roadmap that I needed, I actually implemented a lot of those principles in the book and still implementing. And I thought, well, now, you know, when you find out something, you don't keep it to yourself. So I thought now I've learned these very basic principles. I've passed them on to my children who are now debt free, by the way, except my son owes on a house, but all that consumer debt, credit card debt, my children don't live in that world, but they used to. They used to. So once I got myself straight, I got my kids straight, I'm thinking, you know, I need to dedicate this book to them. And I think I have that in my book that I've dedicated the book to my children, but also their generation and generations to come so that they don't make the same mistakes that my generation made in my culture. So I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier when I asked you if you thought it was an African-American thing, but I generally statistically uh, African-Americans are behind their um, white American counterparts when it comes to generational wealth, especially. And now you, Sabrina, are married to a white man. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> so have you found that you share differences in how, you know, the whole money process thing, especially when you first got married. And how do you guys now as a family talk about money in your family? It was, it was kind of odd when we got married because I didn't want to share financially and he wanted to share everything. And I was very uncomfortable about that. Very uncomfortable about talking about it, what I had, what he had. And how do we merge those things together for the greater good of the household? And now it took us a couple of years. I'm not going to lie. It took us a couple of years to be in sync financially on because where you put your money, how long is it going to be there? What is the objective of it? I want to invest. You don't want to invest all kinds of maybe we should buy property. Uh, maybe, we, you know, all kinds of things. And I remember there were some very tense moments between us when he wanted to go do something. And I was like, I, ooh, I don't know. <laughs> Only because I, I hadn't been exposed to that. I had not been exposed to investing in something or buying a property. I, I, I And he had. So that there were some definitely some cultural differences. And so I passed on some things that I probably shouldn't have. But now we're on the same mindset, especially with my, you know, my newfound knowledge and my past experiences, I'm able to help. And now we make really good financial decisions right now. Um, he still talks about a little bit more than I do. I mean, I'm on the coaching side of it, but yeah, we've, we've found that space. So I, I do see that when I work with clients as well, there'll be one that wants to talk about it. One that doesn't one that wants to share one that doesn't. And people are very, I don't want to say people in general, some people are very awkward. You can still feel the tension and the tenseness when you start asking about their finances. Mm -hmm. They don't want to talk about how much money they make. They don't want to talk about what do they have in savings or what they don't have in savings. They don't want to talk about how many people they owe, what their credit score looks like. It's uncomfortable for them I, to talk. I remember years ago, my good friend, was an accountant and we, so we were getting to know each other and she mentioned she was an accountant of course she was hoping that as her friend I'd give her my business and I'm like I don't want nobody to know my business especially somebody who's in my circle I don't want them to know my business so I absolutely agree it can be a very awkward conversation but I think when somebody takes on a coach just like if they took on any kind of counselor you'd like to think that they'd open up to at least that person. It should be some level of confidentiality in that relationship. So 
I totally agree. And, and familiarity is okay too. I'm the same way. I know you're going to know my, my finances and everything, but really it should be someone that you trust, you know, like, know, and trust. Uh, there should be either a referral or something in there that connects you to that person. Right. Because let's face it, you're talking about something that's the groundwork for your life, your livelihood and your sustenance. So there should be some trust factor there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Sabrina, you are now a financial coach and you've had all this history and all these awakenings and all these new understandings and all these ahas and everything. So walk us through what it would mean to actually work with you. What, what, what would that look like? A coaching relationship with Sabrina Protig? Well, I start out by asking questions. You know, I'll share a little experience. My son came into some money many, many years ago. I, again, not being experienced with money, we went to one of the big box financial people and this guy probably had 10 letters behind his name and he talked so far over our head uh, and showing us sheets and spreadsheets and, and I couldn't even digest it. And and when I walked out of there, it was too much. It was overwhelming. Cause, so guess what? We did nothing. We did nothing with that money because it was overwhelming. So I don't want to ever uh, have my clients experience that. It's not about me. It's not about my knowledge. I can shine my penny all day long and you'll walk away and won't have, won't be, won't feel that you could make any strategy moves because I talk way too much about me, my experience. So working with me means me getting to know you. What are your habits? What do you like to do for recreation? What, what are some of your goals for your children or your pets? You know, what's important to you? finding out about you and how you move in society, how you move day-to-day -day living, and then asking a lot of questions. And so I get to know you. And as I get to know you, then I can start sharing some strategies that kind of fit within who you are. And maybe sometimes you need to make changes and we'll talk about those changes. But first of all, establishing a good foundation of communication. And I can see that we're on the same page, that you're understanding me and that I'm understanding you. So when you walk, when most of my clients walk out of a meeting with me, whether it's in person or virtual, there's a gratitude, a feeling of gratitude. Like, thank you so much for spending that time with me. Very rarely when I meet with someone, Trudy, does money even change hands. There's no fee to work with me. It's not about, okay, get your checkbook out, you know, here is, you know, write me, I just spent an hour with you. So it's not about that. It's about quality of the relationship. And me seeing where you need have a need and addressing that need over a period of a couple of meetings. So that's how I handle it. Did you say that you don't charge to work with you? No, I don't. I do not charge. I do not charge. So that's what separates me from a lot of financial. I don't know about you, but I don't. How do you work for free? Yep. Hey, Bill. Oh, that's, that's a great question. So I offer high value low cost financial products. And it is those carriers that pay me. So if we implement a financial plan that involves you utilizing some of those products, then they pay me. You don't pay me. Now, sometimes some things we do, maybe let's say it's budgeting and a spreadsheet. There's no, there's no carrier that's paying me to do that. But what's going to happen is you'll start to see an increase in your assets, your financial assets. And now you have some money to play with. Now you have some money to get a, a retirement product or to get an income protection product. Now we have something to work with. And if you implement a financial strategy that involves a financial product, then that's where I, I receive my payment. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? It does. So, yeah, the big box guys, uh, what happens is you got to have investable assets. So if maybe a middle class person walks in and they don't have two pennies to rub together, they're probably not going to work with you because they work with people that have money to invest and they can they can help you make money, but they're making money also. But with me, I work with the middle class where I have to teach you how to have some money to invest and how to protect your financial assets, how to wealth build. And you know, I have the steps. You have to have income, start with savings, start with some residual, residual incomes, build your financial portfolio. They're all in the book. So it's teaching financial habits 
so we can get to the place of those financial products. All right. Well, mm -hmm. so is that then, and you mentioned virtual, you mentioned in person. So did you have like a course or is it just straight up one-on-one? Uh, -on -one? Is it group coaching? How are you handling that? Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. So I'm actually having a uh, curriculum uh, put together as we speak. Now, there may be some cost to that because that's coursework. But that curriculum will be based on this book and, and teaching financial habits. There are going to be tools associated with this, spreadsheets, all types of things. And so that curriculum coursework, there will be a fee for that. Because, you know, that's my time and that's my expertise and that's my book. But those habits should lead to you implementing financial strategies. What we want everyone to do is have a financial strategy. I didn't have one when I lost my job. So I was like responding to things. I wasn't being proactive. And the whole point of this is to get to a point where you have strategies that are implementable that's going to change your financial assets for yourself, your family, and generations to come. All right. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Hindsight to insight, money between friends and family. And please connect with Sabrina at sabrinaprotic.com. And I will put that in the credits for you so you spell it correctly when you're checking that out. And thank you so much, Sabrina. Thank you, Trudy. I've enjoyed being on the show.